So hello everybody, um, I'm very happy to be here and to have you uh, for the second um, appointment of Breathing Printout. Um, just for the ones who don't know yet, Breathing Printout is a series of conversation hosted by Kunstale Lissabon and dedicated to five editorial projects uh, that may be books, magazine, publishing houses and to self-care. Um, as a matter of fact, what struck our attention was uh, actually the, the huge um, commitment of many magazines uh, to um, actually focusing their attention on self-care and some of them on, you know, uh, the improvement of res desire, relaxation and the spirituality. I'm, talk I'm talking about Philly magazine, Hammam, uh, Hignota books and some others uh, promoting the new ways of improving personal researches without any labels and restriction. And now I'm talking about Pantano books and Frankenstein magazine. Uh, today, uh, we have the pleasure to have Hammam magazine, um, uh, which are actually um, following has connected with us from New Mexico and Hamam is founded by Ekin Bejolu. I hope I pronounce it well. I would be very <laughs> proud if I did, but I'm not sure. And mm -hmm. see which are now connected with us. And just before starting, uh, I wanted to thank again our sponsor who made uh, this possible, uh, DJ Artes, Coleção Maria Armando Cabral, and especially uh, Colezione Govino from Naples, uh, who decided to support Breathing Printout. And so here we are, and you can see Hekin and Steve here connected with us. They are going to talk a bit about a mom and showing us a bit of the magazine. Then if you have any question or you want to satisfy some curiosity about any uh, bad practice, feel free to, to ask anything you want. And so there will be the play after the, the moment for a Q&A. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, greetings from Taos, New Mexico. Um, Hamam HQ is based here. And um, we will give a quick presentation about um, our magazine, why we launched it, and then looking forward to have a conversation with you all. Um, is the slide moving now, Alberta? Yes, they are. Yeah, perfect, great. Um, I'm Ekim Baljiolu. I'm the editor-in-chief and co-founder of Hamam. I'm a visual artist, editor, and curator from Turkey. And despite growing up in Turkey, I didn't get into communal bathing until I moved to New York. And um, in New York, I made communal bathing at a Russian bathhouse my daily practice for two and a half years. And after that, um, I moved back to San Francisco where I completed my master's in arts and started working there at a Russian bathhouse as a plaza master as pictured here. Um, and we that's where we met. Yeah. My name is Steve. Uh, I run the business side of Hamam and uh, which is focused on shipping, logistics and sales all over the world. I made Russian steam bathing my own personal practice of letting go um, about five years ago. And I began my personal relationship with water uh, in the US Navy. I was a nuclear engineer on a submarine. Um, Hamam was launched last year uh, in the middle of the pandemic because there wasn't a magazine out there that cared enough about a good soak. It, we explore the art and culture of bathing and many other practices of letting go uh, in the magazine, which features essays, artist projects, photography, and interviews with all sorts of unconventional spirits around the world. Um, the debut issue of Hamam received an Editorial Design Achievement Award in Turkey and was named Best in the Mag by Page Magazines. Um, a magazine of the week by Mac Culture and a Kickstarter project we love. 
We were also featured by Bathing Culture, Mag Culture, Stack Magazines, Creative Review. And we like to think of Hammam as more than just a magazine, but as an object of letting go that you can hold in your hand. And when we came up with the idea of creating a magazine, we wanted to write our core beliefs. And we believe on bathing, all beings undergo a physical, emotional, and spiritual transformation when they emerge from a bath. The greatest liberation is the freedom to express yourself. Art connects people, heightens your awareness, and opens you up to different perspectives. Nobody is the same, but everyone is equal and welcome. When we heal our minds and bodies together, we rid the world of suffering. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our logo. Um, Hamam is Turkish baths and it's written the Turkish way, which is with one M. And the design takes its inspiration from the architecture of Hamams. And depending on whether you are inside the hammam or outside, our logo transforms and looks like the domes of hammams. It also stretches, melts, melts, and takes different kind of forms. And zooming in on some of the details here, these geometric shapes resemble the glass inserts in the hammam dome that lets light through. Hamam's design is very free flowing and the editorial design also mimics the visual design. Every issue is different. Every section is designed differently and no two pages are alike. Hamam One Dedication, the debut issue, lost, launched last fall and featured articles about Victorian Turkish baths in the British Isles an artist interview with a painter named James Mortimer who lives in Bath, England. And just like a bathhouse, Hammam has regulars as well. Shebnem Shoher, who lives in Lisbon, is a uh, Turkish architect and our architect in residence that writes about different bathing architecture all over the world in every issue. Hamam to heat is our winter issue and we wanted our audience to feel the warmth in cold winter days when reading Hamam. So we collaborated with artists who had a close relationship with heat. Um, in each magazine, we have a section called Recipes Remedies where we um, collaborate with artists, writers or bat enthusiasts and they talk about their recipes of their bathing rituals, um, such as in this one, my former colleague from the Russian bathhouse talks about uh, how to give the perfect platza. Um, we featured Turkish photographer Ahmed Sel and his series Oriental Illusions. We also look at many practices of letting go, such as Chado tea ceremony from Japan, Sky Burial in Mongolia, and Lucid Dreaming. Hammam 3 Water is our latest issue, which released this spring, and features artists and their connections to all forms of water. Grandma Divers from Korea. And the latest Recipes and Remedies section, Bathing with Herbs, a Self-Love Practice. Hamam is available in over 50 bookshops book and bathing uh, spots all over the world and in 15 plus countries. Our fabulous team works between the US and Istanbul, Turkey. And we'd love to open it up for your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you guys. That was very uh, like, yeah, you summarize every aspect of the magazine that since the beginning really struck our attention. And um, in fact, I wanted to ask you because you, you uh, slightly probably already touched it, but I think it's a very important um, thing to focus for a while the attention of our for your first idea of distribution that uh, once Hakim told me that you were thinking of distribute 
the magazine in the actually bathhouses. And I think it's very important to, to say something more about it, if you wish. Absolutely. Um, actually, we thought this would be such a unique strategy to distribute in bathhouses because many of the bathhouses doesn't allow any electronics. Mm -hmm. And all sometimes people feel the need to read there. So we thought this is the perfect environment. However, um, we created the idea last December. And then when we were thinking of publishing it, it was the lockdowns all over the world and many of the bed houses closed. So we had to change that strategy a little bit. But now that they are reopening, we started selling in a few different bed houses. Okay, cool. So you can actually mm -hmm. now realize that you're, yeah, that's fantastic because I think it's also important not just because you can um, spread the word in a place where it's already appreciated, but also to let people understand how universal that can be because of course as you said already in a mom there are in the magazine there are um so many different approaches to the different practices and so yeah i think it's also important to spread the word in the place where these practices are um yeah are like daily activities, but you maybe you don't know that in Russia or in Japan, they are doing something similar. And I think it's extremely important to do it. And also because it's nice, uh, we will probably already talk about it, but to change a bit um, the idea, for example, in Turkey, you are saying that it's not something very usual or at least well perceived or not. Um, well, I, one of the reasons we wanted to create this magazine was also to change the perception of hammams in Turkey, because um, not everyone appreciates this culture, and sometimes it might even feel like low culture. Moms that has I lost you. Um, just being destroyed. I actually had few people who reached out to me saying that they know this old hammam and it's just abandoned and what can they do about that? So that is something that we give a lot of importance to, to um, change the perception of hammams in Turkey. Okay. Yeah, I think I've lost you for a second at the beginning, but yeah, then you 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 said what you were saying. Yeah, sure. Okay, no, that's cool. Um, how you said briefly how you start everything started, but um, you probably didn't mention, but I know that you are a plaza master. Is it? Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. tell us more about that if you would like? Absolutely. Um. So when I was in New York, that was the first time I got introduced to Plaza at Russian and Turkish baths, which they call it the Russian acupuncture. And um, it is a form of treatment where a person, the Plaza master takes the client into 200 Fahrenheit, uh, 200 Fahrenheit mm -hmm. degree sauna. And then you have different kinds of leaves um, like we call it venix. Okay. And then it's sometimes oak, sometimes birch, and you beat the person with those leaves. And then it brings all the steam to your body and it's a very intense treatment. It probably lasts like five minutes, seven minutes in the sauna. You do it the whole body and makes you feel amazing. But it's also very hardcore practice for the person and right after that you go into a cold plunge and stay in the cold plunge as long as you can and you feel reborn after that so when I was in New York I was doing it to my friends my friends were doing it to me so I got used to the practice 
And when I moved to San Francisco, um, I said, I would love to learn the art of plaza. And my, my colleague, Chad, who wrote the recipes remedies was my tutor teaching me this practice. And then that's how I got into the plaza world. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. And that's how, also how you met, or am I wrong? Yeah, I was a regular at the bathhouse in, um, in San Francisco. And uh, it was, there were a lot of older Russian men and myself just kind of mm -hmm. would sit there throughout the day. And, um, and one day I can walk in and uh, we started talking and kind of the rest is history. <laughs> but uh, it, it, the, the the bathhouse is really unique in that it incorporates a lot of different um, bathing cultures all in one place. Mm -hmm. um, there, so there's Japanese hot pools, there's the Russian sauna, a Finnish sauna. Um, there's a steam room that sort of resembles a Turkish hammam or a Moroccan hammam. And, uh, and to your point earlier about um, how uh, the magazine brings in all these different cultures and um, kind of mixes them up together in, in one place um, and shares diff these different practices of not just bathing, but letting go all over the world. Um, that's really kind of what keeps us going and what drives the, the vision of the magazine. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because now listening to you talking about the environment also, it's so clear looking at the magazine, because actually one of the first things that um, somehow enchanted me from the magazine was that I felt lost, but in a good way, um, mm -hmm. by um, looking at it. Because nowadays when you take a magazine, you understand after a few seconds what it's about, what's gonna be inside or you know the structure somehow. And even if it's a new one, sometimes you can recognize where it's going, the direction. And when I had a mom the first time in my hands, I thought, oh, so it's about uh, photographies. But then there was an essay, uh, super well written uh, from actually the Turkish bath in England. Uh, correct me if I, because I'm going right. I just. <laughs> And that was super interesting because it was about architecture, it was about uh, culture. And yeah, there was a that, that big mix that um, really impressed me. And it was interesting to see, as I was saying before, how, um, yeah, it can be so inclusive, uh, a practice, but also an idea. So I think your magazine is very, uh, very an inclusive one, yeah. Yeah, I really, I really like it for this. Mm. I think we already have a question I, because I can talk about your magazine and ask you things mm -hmm. like forever, but we have a question. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna read it and then I go on with mine. <laughs> Since it is such a unique, can you read it also from the chat guys? Mm -hmm. okay. It's a unique topic. How has the worldwide response to Hamam ma magazine been? Yeah, it's interesting. Well, it, we're really impressed, even given such a unique time to launch a magazine, just how how far and wide Hammam has traveled during the past year. Um, as we mentioned before, when we started the project, um, COVID wasn't on anyone's mind, and we thought we would be uh, doing a launch party in a uh, ancient Hammam in Istanbul. So a lot of things changed uh, within the last year, but um, Hamam is uh, in um, over 50 stores and bathing spots all over the world. We've mentioned some of them have opened up recently and have uh, carry Hamam in their gift shops um, and is in over 15 countries. It's been a challenge from the logistics side to set that all up in, in the past year, but we have a fulfillment center in uh, the UK. And uh, we also fulfill from uh, Turkey and uh, here in the United States. And to add something to that, um, one of the most surprising and wonderful things for me has been getting submissions 
or getting stories of people's experience with soaking, saunas, and even some practices that I never heard before, such as a um, few weeks ago, I got this submission from Japan where he said that he's um, a black ribbon holder in soaking. So, which means he'd been to more than thousands of hot springs um, in Japan, and I didn't know anything about this tradition. Or in our fourth issue, which we are printing right now, um, there is a practice that I never heard of before. Um, the president of British Sauna Association wrote about that called schmacing, which is communal scrubbing. So, you, you know, with people's responses, uh, I love learning more about this world, which is so experimental and alternative in a way. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And I mean, you can also find uh, the, the one that suits the most to you, the one you feel more comfortable with, because it's also something you really need to, you know, feel comfortable with when you are doing it. Yeah. But I mean, questions are like a lot. Um, Wait, okay, Luis is asking, you have mentioned the practice of letting go. I'm curious about how that practice has been influenced, changed, re, uh, re-articulated in the context of COVID. Well, there's a lot of ways um, to answer that. And I see uh, Luis also ask, and can letting go uh, help people or understood as a political practice? Can it be understood as a response to the world as it re- uh, presents itself right now? And um, I think uh, my own personal perspective is um, the more time you can spend away from your phone, uh, the better these days. Um, I, I personally am using um, bathing or uh, uh, recently gardening, you know, setting up a vegetable garden for the for the year, um, working with my hands more, reading books rather than uh, text on a screen. Um, every way that I can kind of distance myself from uh, or just keep technology kind of at bay. Um, that's that's helped me personally with uh, with letting go in the con and as it relates to politics, um, I don't read news anymore. Um, I've, I've do my best here in the US to kind of uh, classify politics as like a sport and, um, and people are on different teams and they root for different teams. And so um, I try to kind of keep it where it is and where it belongs, which is something that's important, but it doesn't necessarily affect my life on a day-to-day basis unless I make it part of my life on a day-to-day basis. And with COVID, well, it's closed a lot of communal bathhouses, but um, it's very hard to get a sauna or a hot tub installed at your house these days because they're sold out. And uh, so a lot of people have made their, their letting go practice a home practice, which is why we um, have this section about recipes and remedies so people can kind of take the uh, different practices um, into their kitchen or into their bath, uh, their bathrooms at home. Yeah, we try to encourage people to um, take all different kind of these practices of letting go and apply it to their own world in a way. It doesn't necessarily have to be in a communal bath. And it doesn't have to be actually a practice that is about bathing either, um, such as I show the spread of the tea ceremony. We had, we were so lucky to uh, got introduced to um, Mika, who is a master. And she told about her 20 plus year experience in just how she can, in just making a tea, how she's able to use mindfulness and let go. So um, we try to focus on a lot of those kind of stories, poetry, um, sculpture. For example, we have some sculptors who whose practice of letting go is making that sculpture. So 
Now that's very, very refreshing also to hear all of the, this practices. Actually, I don't know where are we with the questions right now, although they're apart from... Um... Okay, can be understood as a political practice. I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. We we touched on that a little bit um, with the letting go, but from Umberto, uh, Umberto yeah. uh, apart from Hammam and Plaza, what are other bath cultures you are enthusiastic about? Uh, well, we have a, a a dry sauna here in the backyard um, that we uh, that is traditionally Finnish, um, and we so we practice. Uh, steam bathing in our backyard. Uh, we also love hot springs culture, um, particularly in the Western US. There are many natural hot springs um, uh, throughout uh, the, the landscape here, which really allows you to be in a very um, a quiet, uh, almost meditative retreat-like environment, uh, which we appreciate very much. Um, we also, with once things kind of ease up on international travel, would love to do a week or two in Japan, yeah. <laughs> kind of working our way through onsens and sentos in Japan. Um, what? So we have been recently traveling a lot. We got a van, and one of our favorite things to do is to find the hot springs. It's either uh, develop one or just natural one and soak there. Um, we also have a big river here and around the river we have few little hot springs that are all natural. So to me, I never previously swam in rivers, but last summer that became something incredible for me where we go into the little hot spring, muddy, not, you know, uh, anything, you know, not luxurious at all and then just diving into the river so really enjoying that <laughs> yes we would love to we, we we actually we we really wanted to be in in portugal uh and i've been to lisbon before but we we want to travel the the countryside there and oh, uh and and uh, would love to. We, we there's a I believe one of the recent issues featured a yeah Shebnam actually wrote about in issue three uh, Alvaro Siza's pools the tidal pools and I would love to go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should definitely come. And also, uh, we, yeah, we have some. Sorry to interrupt. We have some really incredible response from Portugal and some of the coolest people I met has been from Portugal so far. Um, in our in issue four, we are featuring um, an uh, artist designer uh, who was the found who is the founder of Bad Stage Sessions. Okay. And she basically films different musicians in their bathrooms. So uh, we have an interview with her in our upcoming issue. And she um, lives in she lives in an island close to Lisbon, but I don't remember the name of the <laughs> island. <laughs> cool. Now that's very cool. That's very interesting. And in, in the coming one, and did you say already, or am I missing what is going to be about? Because they have some topic, right? I mean, or at least main, like. Yeah. You uh, say already what is focus on? Yes, so each issue we have a different theme and it, it was dedication, heat, water, and this upcoming issue is naked. So <laughs> <laughs> and we look at different uh, kind of nakedness, mental, spiritual, physical. Um, we feature artists, writers, for example, who did a residency in a nudist um, uh, artist, nudist community in London and yeah so it's going to be a interesting issue I think I think this upcoming one is my favorite so far <laughs> and it just went to the printers so should be on sale later this summer yeah oh wow so such on point perfect <laughs> and we really need 
actually, I guess, this summer more than all the others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool, cool. So do we have other questions we still have to reply to or you guys have to? And now this is an advice for me. You see, come try to Dorian Hot Springs. You have a formal invitation from Louis. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll take you up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, actually, uh, there is an uh, how the magazine supports itself. Yeah. Well, we've self-funded to get it started. Uh, we did a Kickstarter as well. Uh, that was a, a successful campaign and. Um, help cover most of the costs for printing. We haven't done advertising yet in the magazine. It's something we think about, but with 112 pages, we, we sometimes have a challenge just to uh, cut material and content to get into uh, a small space like that. But um, it's, a, it's profitable, barely, but mm -hmm. um, is, uh, is really a, a, a passion project for us. And, one that we see uh, kind of expanding into a lot of different spaces at some point in the future. And uh, we have a lot of exciting things coming up in the next year and some special editions that we can't wait to announce. Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, actually, because I'm thinking that if you start really to um, distribute it more through the um, but but houses and hamams and whatever, they will probably be interested in like showing their place on the magazine and not with an article but also with a proper commercial and mm -hmm. if it's well done because most of them maybe i think are not really into this kind of stuff so but if you try to you know let them be involved can be also a nice way to yeah to push a bit also you know the, the the awareness of the people about it, I think is very of course. Yeah. And no, okay. I what I wanted to ask you since the really beginning is mm -hmm. actually um, something that because the first time we spoke, me and the Kim, I heard that you discovered the culture of Bath when you moved to New York, even if you grew up in Tur in Turkey, where Hamad culture actually is is common. And I found this extremely interesting because I think that the need to take care of our um, well-being, both mentally and physical, um, corresponds with the moment in which we start to have more awareness of our body in, in general, in the world, in the society, and what we really need. And even if this may sound a bit weird or stupid, um, I think it's important because that could mean that actually the self-care uh, doesn't not coincide only with the culture you are growing in, but also with the awareness that you have of your body. So I don't know if it's a question, but I mm. think that your experience was like the key to read also this because it doesn't matter where you're actually coming from because what you realize growing up is what gives you the no the yeah um to add to that a little bit i can say that the bats made me feel sane in new york otherwise mm -hmm. <laughs> with the winters uh, it was the first time i was experiencing snow in a city living in a snowy place coming from izmir it's usually hot and then san francisco has been quite nice as well so with the intensity of the city and intensity of the, uh, you know, trying to survive as an artist uh, for, as a first time graduate, that kept, kept me feeling good. That kept me, you know, <laughs> looking at the following days and not giving up because there have been t times in New York where it can get quite difficult. Mm -hmm. So to have that ritual for myself where I took care of my body, where I took care of my um, mental health and uh, let go of things, you know, just left my clothes upstairs in the locker room, left my phone and spent a few, few hours in a dark cave looking room and then going into the cold and hot and cold and hot and meeting people. That was one of the greatest memories I have 
Yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. I don't know, Steve, if you want to add something to, to that or. I, well, I was, uh, I was overworking uh, in San Francisco myself and wasn't taking care of my mental health or my physical health. And a business advisor asked uh, if I ever take any breaks. We were at a holiday party and I said, no, not really. And he said, you ever gone to the Russian baths? And I said, no, I didn't even know that they existed in San Francisco. So I looked it up and um, made an appointment and uh, it all kind of changed in the sauna for me when I was getting a plaza um, and kind of was transported to a different world. And uh, that world was uh, a happier place than um, than my office and I just started to continue with the routine and probably had, didn't talk to anyone for a couple of years just used it as like a retreat for myself um, until I can walked in and then I <laughs> ta I talked to her <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's nice. it's nice also because I heard hmm, many people that actually um, rediscover the importance of um, these practices, or at least the, to care about their self more after COVID or with COVID. And you actually mm -hmm. said before, so it's also, I'm sure you, you know, um, you can guide us through these <laughs> discoveries that we are mm -hmm. because of COVID. But we have other questions coming, and Luis is curious about the process of starting a magazine. How did you go from your interest in practices of letting go to an editorial project? Why not just opening your own business or a website, blog, etc.? What excites you about the idea of a magazine? And the, the next one actually, uh, the next question actually ties in as well. If there are any public other publications that inspired you in particular, what kind of other mags you appreciate? Yeah, thank you. Um, so with my background in art, I always loved creating things and talking to different artists, uh, you know, most of them my friends, talking to different writers. And while working at the Bad House, I really wanted to do something that was going to unite the community because I realized there was nothing for this community that unites them apart from the physical space. So um, I was thinking maybe doing a photo project, maybe doing some stories about my colleagues because these were the most interesting people I ever met in my life. So I wanted to somehow share this incredible subculture with the rest of the world. And we were even thinking maybe like doing something like Humans of New York. Mm -hmm. And one day Steve asked me if I have heard of the Wet Magazine. And WET was a, an avant-garde publication from the late 70s to early 80s. And it was the magazine of gourmet bathing. And it was really kind of a, a design publication, um, graphic design publication that um, was loosely based around uh, bathing culture. Um, and so that uh, as itself was sort of a, a known uh, entity within the design world, um, but it wasn't really for the bathing community. And so we kind of used that as a little bit of inspiration. The, uh, the founder uh, went on to publish more works um, about uh, bathing and, um, and art and design. So we consulted with him um, in early days. To Actually, just he was the first person we shared the project with. Okay. And um, we sent him a cold outreach. He was very encouraging. Encouraging. Uh, his name is Leonard Coren. And we said, this is wonderful. But apart from him, whoever we talked to, uh, they were like, don't start a magazine. It's not <laughs> a profitable business. And uh, we didn't want to have anything online either. We just wanted to do a print publication because we really appreciate books and being able to touch and to have something like not looking at the screen but having something where you hold it um so 
but we didn't have any experience yeah. with magazine <laughs> production. So we kind of didn't know what we didn't know. And um, probably, if we, probably if we had known more then we, we wouldn't have gone through with it. Like all the, <laughs> all the advice deterring us from doing so. <laughs> But the, uh, to get back to a question about um, why not just open a business or do a website or blog, uh, and and I think you know just to kind of hit home the point, it was really about giving people within the bathing community um, something that would bring that could bring them together outside of just the physical space, and uh, because electronics are not part of that um, physical space we wanted to give them the option to perhaps read while they're there, um, something they could bring home with them. Uh, Hamam is a, it's a more substantive magazine than most on the newsstand. So it, it, it kind of uh, defies time. You don't need to read them in order necessarily. They can sit on your coffee table for a while until you're kind of ready to pick it up. Um, and it's, uh, but we, we do see uh, in, in creating the brand and, and being able to service this community other ways where we can uh, potentially uh, develop new products or uh, experiences um, under Hamam uh, in the future. Uh, one of them is a dream project of opening a retreat center. So <laughs> <laughs> hopefully that will happen. And then to go back to the project, uh, sorry, the question, some of the other publications that inspired me was, for example, Cabinet Magazine. Mm -hmm. And the found, one of the founders of Cabinet Magazine was my previous um, professor. So I was able to talk to him about that. Um, there was a curat curatorial magazine called Exhibitionist. And one of the editors for that is also was my professor, my mentor. So I had the luck to talk with him as well while we were coming up with the project. So um, there is a Turkish magazine from the 90s called Fall, F-O-L, okay. which was massive. It's like probably this size and it's not binded. So it's loose pages that are folded together. Okay. And <laughs> that was a, that, was something that I actually discovered later on, but it was like a legend magazine in Turkey. So that really inspired me as well. Okay, oh, that's cool because they all have a particular vibe. And even if they don't have at least something I think about um, exhibitionist or the other one that you just described, they are very different and the content for them are very precise in a way. Um, but yeah, they have this passion behind that you can feel it when when you when you hold it. Yeah, definitely. Cool. And oh my God, oh, we have first Anna asking, how do you decide on the theme of each issue? What's the process? Do we want to talk about your process? Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well. It is very, very free flowing freestyle kind of process, I would say. Actually, with the first issue, we didn't have the team. We didn't come up with the team and then uh, created the magazine. We created the magazine, then the team automatically came up, came up together because we realized we featured artists, writers um, who dedicated their lives to bathing. So we thought, and for issue one, dedication would be perfect. For issue two, we actually came up with the theme first. I wanted to do something that is going to make you feel hot, that is going to warm you. And since we were so far away from bathing, as most of them were, the bathing spots were closed, we wanted you to feel that heat when you read, that mag when you read the magazine. So that's how we came up with the second issues team. And for three, we said, um, we, you know, the more and more I research and the more and more I talk to people, I realized how much of an importance water have in my life. And previously I've been working a lot in watercolor too, uh, as a painter. 
So we wanted to create an issue around water. I'm going to show you why you talk. Go. <laughs> <laughs> and all of our uh, covers are representing, in a way, our team as well. And when you look at this third issue's logo, for example, it is like water. It's transparent. It's fluid. And then when you look at the cover of um, second issue, uh, it is melting. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> so the way metal looks when it's being yeah. uh, heated up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but it's a process more akin to uh, like jazz improvisation, where maybe there's like a theme or an idea mm -hmm. ahead of time and the team just kind of works together to uh, to create that, but there's no um, real hard and fast rules or guidelines. Every section's different mm -hmm. um, and every page is different. There are no templates. There are no um, a precise frameworks with which we uh, limit ourselves in terms of design. Yeah, yeah in fact, the design change. Every and time. in terms of content as well. So we never say, for example, oh, we need to have two short stories, uh, five photo essays, two painters, two interviews. It's never like that. It always changes in each issue. In one issue, we have more photo essays. In this coming up, upcoming issue, for example, we have a lot of interviews and stories. And then in another one, it will be many um, poetry, for example. So even the content is always changing with each magazine. That's cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, uh, we have also an important question for you guys. Feel free. How do you see the future of a mom magazine? How do you see it in five years time? Well, when we started, we committed to doing Hamam for a year and we're there now at this mm -hmm. point. So we have plans now for um, for the next several issues. So we'll uh, we'll continue to to publish the magazine as long as there's more to say on the topic. And we think that there are ways to kind of expand Hamam into, as we mentioned before, um, other areas, um, both in in uh, products, uh, art, experiences, events. Um, and we're just going to kind of see how things go over the next uh, couple of months and years as we kind of emerge from, um, from being socially distant. And um, hopefully there's an opportunity for all of us to get together at some point and sweat and, um, and, and really build community. And that's kind of what Hamam is all about. No, that's cool. That all, what all of us are actually wish now right now yeah that's very important and hearing you talking about poetry i also think that i mean this uh program a breathing print out also the aim is to bring together different realities and different people with different interests and in fact the first episode was dedicated to uh, pantano books and they are committed to actually ask poet poets and translation of poems so it's very very interesting to put you in a way in contact because mm -hmm. sure it can be helpful in a way for all of us okay i think we, we we are done with the question i don't know if you guys want to add something uh, just for our public um the issue all of them will be available here in constales so please pass by and <laughs> buy them um, no, I don't know, guys, if you want to add something. We really appreciate the opportunity today. Uh, thanks very much for having us and for tuning in. Uh, you can follow us at Hamam Magazine on Instagram and uh, hamammag.com. Perfect. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you so much, guys. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.